Welcome to City on a Hill Gaming, a tabletop RPG actual play podcast. To find out more, download episodes wherever you get podcasts, or visit us online at cityonahillgaming.com, or by sending us an email at cityonahillgaming at gmail.com. You can also support us on patreon.com slash cityonahillgaming. We hope you enjoy our show. Welcome back to City on a Hill Gaming. I am, I am your Ryan. Hi. Um, I am not your narrator this evening because we don't have a narrator this evening because, well, we're going to do something different. I am joined by a Grant. Hey. A Peter. Hey. A Daniel. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. It was going to happen eventually. A Cameron. Hello and good luck. And a Greg. Hi. Uh, 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 fresh from being sick, Greg. So Greg is a little less Greg than normal, but that's okay. Um, so this is our first semi-annual, so that I don't over or under promise, semi-annual city council meeting uh, here on City on the Hill Gaming, where we sit down with people who, who've been on City on the Hill, Hill Gaming, and we talk about stuff. That's what you do at a city council meeting, I think. I don't go, I don't. For work, I cover government meetings, but not city council. I mostly cover county commission. But we're city on a hill, not county on a hill. So city council. County on a hill would be an awful name. It would hmm. be a very big hill. It would be or a very a small enormous county. Enormous hill. Um, so we're going to talk about family-friendly gaming and faith-based gaming and what we're doing currently or the things you've heard recently and... Maybe what changes we can make about some things, but we'll we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. So, everyone here this evening has been on City on a Hill uh, at least a couple of times, and by at least a couple of times, I actually mean more than a couple of times for I think all of you. Um, Cameron, maybe the least times, and that's still at like five or six. <laughs> um, so Cameron and let's see if I can get this right. Cameron and Greg are both in the Kingmaker game. Peter and Grant were both in the Impulse Drive game, and by that I mean Grant ran the Impulse Drive game, and Daniel has finally returned after 10,000 hours, minutes. After some length of time, Daniel's back, Um, and will hopefully be with us again in the future with whatever that is, because spoilers, at time of recording, we don't know what we're doing next yet, but that's okay. We'll figure it out eventually. Um, It'll be more nonsense, I can promise you that much. I can always promise you that much. It so, will always be nonsense. It will always be not ever not nonsense. Not ever we, not sure. That's fine. Yeah. Or we, that is the biggest export of the city on the hill. Mm-hmm. Nonsense uh, from the factory. Yeah. Our number I one believe we have, yep. We have established that we have a nonsense factory. Yes. Mm-hmm. That is something it's, the city council would, would do. You would approve uh, building permits and uh, payment in lieu of taxes plans and those kinds of things. Thanks to our Patreon sponsors, patreon.com slash city on the hill gaming. I couldn't help myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a highly productive Good. nonsense factory. Good. It is. Good timing. That we turn it out. So um, I'm going to ask the five of you a question that I may or may not answer. I haven't decided yet. And whoever Rexy. wants to hop, whoever wants to hop in can hop in. What is how, how is the experience different playing an intentionally, and the word I will politely use is aggressively, family-friendly game different. How has that been different for you? And who, whoever think, wants to go first can go first. Well, I, I can jump in on that because I've I've run a couple of the games here on City on a Hill, and I'm Thank actually you, gearing up to run a family game uh, of Dungeons & Dragons. For, Exciting. You know, my two kids and my wife. And I'm... <laughs> First off, my son, who is, you know, early elementary school, I think he has figured out that if he says that he's scared of every monster and wants to put that behind, you know, a line, then he automatically wins all of D&D. The biggest brain like play. Like speed of me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, like sounds if accurate. there are no monsters to fight, you Your win. Your son is the default. safety tool straw man? <laughs> um, strategist, I think. <laughs> No, it's it's actually not quite that bad, but you know, he's he's young and there are things that he's concerned about, kind of, you know, little kid fears. 
I mean, I and, got scared very badly by a frog and toad book when I was a child, so legitimate. Yeah, I mean, Fair. it's stuff that hits you weird and stuff that, like, you don't fully understand. And we have been listening to James Holloway's excellent Monster Man podcast in the car because it's kid-friendly and it covers cool monsters and fun mythological things. And there are only so many episodes of Greeking Out and most of the other podcasts I listen to are not kids safe. Um, delightful, but not kids safe. And that's been fun. But every time, you know, we hear like a, a D&D monster described, it's like, oh, um, that one's maybe off the list. I like, I, I don't think I want that. Like we were listening to the thing on doppelgangers today. And that kind of hit him weird. And he was like, nope, I'm out. So uh, having to work Those around some are of that. aggressively creepy. <laughs> they are. Yeah. Um, although I had thought of a really cool, fun idea that's very positive and I may have, have to introduce that into a game at some point. But, you know, planning around what people actually are super comfortable with, aside from the natural table, you know, good tabletop practice of, hey, let's lay out lines and veils and let's talk about what we're comfortable with. Because if we know where our boundaries are, we can go really hard on the things that are within those boundaries. That's fine, but then doing that on on a show like City on a Hill or for a, a family game, you can't even go that far. And it, as a the guy running the game, I do sometimes find myself going, "Oh, I wish I could do that, but I gotta." figure out how to change the tone or I got to just drop that line of thought and move on to something else. How do I keep this positive, but also not saccharine? Uh, and so I've been struggling with that here for the past week, which is why I bring this up. Uh, but it's something that, you know, we've brought up. And I think in, for example, the uh, season th three campaign of the city on a hill D and D game, I think we hit that fairly well. A little heavier, little, I'll say slightly darker tone, but not in a way that I think was ever necessarily an issue, unless you object to hearing me, Daniel, Peter, uh, Ben, and I think maybe one other person actively rail against uh, economic plans. Well, I mean, it turns out the, the best villains are, you know, people, not monsters. <laughs> the closest so. to what you actually see. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, that's always an interesting process is figuring out where those boundaries are and how to tell a story that's still really engaging without either being, without defaulting to this is a scary, gross thing, or this is actually not much of a threat. Finding a threat that isn't, you know. That is still family friendly is, kind of, you know, something that's Some, dangerous something that's thing. not just like, um, like a kid's cartoon. Yeah, not exactly. devolving and, to the point of like, like for like six and under kind of thing. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. And I think that's a common trap that people oh, yeah. think family friendly means without conflict. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, I think a good uh, way to equate this as well um, is the idea of like television that is targeted at kids versus television that is targeted at kids and has a great message and great character building and great development. Bluey. Like, like, I'm you told have, you're talking like, about Bluey. Well, I mean, I'm talking about Avatar The Last Airbender. <laughs> okay, but that's We've fine. also yeah. been busy with yeah, our That's children the immediate the example that came to so. mind, too. Yeah. We're yeah. two and a half seasons in, and we're about to finish up with the kids. So Yeah, and so like I think that that's a good example of something like this. Like You can boil down family friendly into this everything is safe you're in a bubble bubble wrap um or you can use it as a safe sp sa safe space to explore within specific boundaries like right. the idea that came to mind for me was the idea of like mark rose rotter's um restrictions breed creativity of like okay it's sure, about yeah, trying yeah. to tell the story and how do you how do you make these characters not these flat caricatures in a safe way, in an environment that is intentionally trying to be welcoming to all and something that anybody can jump in, Grant and his, and his kids can listen to, all that kind of stuff. Daniel? I've actually got a different angle that I want to touch on before the conversation moves too far. <laughs> um, 
for for me as a player, because I've only ever been a player in um, these games, I feel a lot of. I'm not even going to say pressure. I'm going to I'm going to say responsibility to have my characters be good role models in some way. Um, I don't know that I have always hit that, <laughs> but like the desire to do that is constantly in the back of my brain. Uh, and that that goes all the way back to uh, my very first appearance, which was Desilov back in season one where I kind of, I found out afterwards, I came in and like altered the whole tone of the podcast. Mm -hmm, with him. Mm -hmm. You broke Jenna. You actively <laughs> broke Jenna into a, in not in a bad way, but in a, oh, we could be doing that kind of way. Yeah, absolutely. When I, th I think there's a, I, there's a line you have to find between, and my analogy may suck, I'll admit that, thing the employee handbook tells you you have to do versus thing you choose to embrace is like a job responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I and and Peter was the first person in show history to embrace this as more of a challenge instead of a guardrail, I guess. Yeah, I I deliberately like okay, so I actually <laughs> at the time I thought you guys were basically doing what Desilov was, so I was like, okay, you know, I I had like all the stress I'm like I'm going to I'm going to set the, you know, best example I possibly can. I'm going to make this really like kind, wholesome character that's got just a lot of virtue and just is really going to, you know, be like merciful and compassionate. And I had no idea that I was doing anything beyond just trying to fit in. We we were so. a little we were a little murder hobo -y still in season one. Not not mm -hmm. to like the traditional sense of that phrase, but not. We weren't where we are now. I think I think that was sort of a learning experience of, of figuring out where we were comfortable going. Uh, Daniel, you had something. Yeah. So um, I guess I can kind of touch on a whole lot of this because I think out of everyone here, I was the only player like active player character in season one. Active regular. It's here tonight. Yeah. 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 Like yeah. regular, regular PC. So uh i i distinctly remember the um the moment for desilov when um there was like a combat and then afterwards you like actively helped one of the people we were fighting and like healed his leg and gave him a stick to walk something of that nature and i remember as as a player going oh this is a moment that like it's it's one of those it, it was one of those like yeah this is this is kind of like a like a not only a character defining moment but this is the first hint of something like kind of unique that we could make this podcast be about that a lot of other like rps or like you know um even like real you know like real play podcast like didn't have and i i kind of took that as like a jumping off point um and it's one of the reasons why i made vatten the way i did in like because i what i really like about what we're doing and i was also going to drop mark rosewater and say restrictions breed creativity <laughs> uh because in in that sense it it does two things one there's a whole bunch of tropes that you basically can't or shouldn't use for like a family-friendly podcast that exist in D D that aren't worth remunerating here because it's again it's just outside of the scope of what we're doing but two you can take the things you like about D D uh, that might not necessarily fit but you can think okay but how can we make this still work within this frame and then that's when the really creative thinking stuff starts so you know how do i make a ranger that has like this harsh backstory but he can then get a redemption arc because a lot of what we can do is about you know we can have this focus on on redemption and being a better person than you used to be or um 
even a character like Ansel, like I felt safer having Ansel in a campaign in this sort of setting rather than one that would be in like a traditional D and D setting, because it's, it, it seemed like a really almost unique place to kind of play in that space. So I really liked, I really liked that aspect of it. And I think, again, it's, it's a good chance to be able to even delve into a little tougher, a little more nebulous subjects without, um, but still be able to wrestle with them, but in, in a way that's, that's, you know, a little, a, maybe a little safer that you know that everyone here is kind of on the same page. So I think, I think, uh, yeah, it's, um, to paraphrase somebody else, it's, it's the difference between the job description and what the job's about. And one, and once you kind of figure in this case, what the game is about and what our sessions are about, rather than just on the face, family friendly, you have, all right, but what is this session about? Like, what's the actual heart of the matter? What's something that, you know, my character is, is like experiencing that works within this greater storyline. And for me, I think that's, that's very freeing because that gets all the creative juices flowing. And it's, you know, kind of a demonstration that you don't need to rely on the murder hobo tropes or, uh, you know, um, something really you know gory or over dramatic or you know all a, a bunch of the other like you know not family friendly things that show up in D D. you don't need to rely on those to still have a good game and i, I one think that, it's one thing going back to oh sorry i just i wanted yeah, yeah, to, go ahead, go ahead. to say something about um ansel is I think one of the things that's that's been interesting, um, and we kind of alluded to this at the beginning when we were talking about like the the nonsense factory and stuff like that, is when um, your standard like D and D bloody violence really isn't on the table, you do have a lot more room for humor because things are inherently safer, like. Um, doing something funny is not going to seriously risk getting your character killed and taken away from you. For instance, like you can, it kind of, it shifts the, um, the frame of the game. So you can, you can find your entertainment in different ways than is typical for D and D, which is kind of fascinating to me. Well, yeah. And that's an interesting point because one of the things that I think really, stands out for family friendly gaming especially the kind that we're doing here is because you know well let's just end this with murder is off the table you know your usual hobo you know murder hobo violence kind of solution i think that opens up a lot more room for social resolutions to encounters um, oh yeah we talk our way around so much stuff yeah um for That's example it's I do feel hope. like Greg and I are just over here like kingmaker is going crazy. But like <laughs> Well, but th and that's the difference between playing something that is is pre-written as a module where, you know, anything you guys do along those lines, we're going to have to make more active decisions for because like when you guys go off the I'll politely say go off the rails because I am very railroady, um partially due to time constraints, partially due to my own inability to do otherwise. Um, We're also literally at the beginning of the campaign, right? Like we haven't like, gotten out of the tutorial yet, basically. Not, not really. Um, yeah, we're still like, in the castle. In in yeah. city, we, we tend to be very railroady. So when you guys, you know, pull the handbrake and cut a hard left, I have to go along with it, and that's fine. It's worked out extraordinarily well for us so far, I think. But it it, it doesn't work as well in a module. Um, and so finding those moments where we do get to do it differently without just making aggressive cuts to whatever's written, which I'm going to do. Uh, and I already have done and I know I will keep doing, but, um, it's weird to find that moment, but, and I think it's funny that, um, that y'all's moment, especially from season one, that the moment of realization for what we could be doing was Desilov because the moment for me as the person running the game wasn't until season two. So you guys got there before I did. It, it was wasn't the, uh, wormling. It, it is with the wormling when we in the first session of season two, right? I present you guys with what's supposed to be a 
a wormling or a drake or whatever, but is actually a dragon. And I have this whole thing worked out that includes everything except you talking to it. So you guys do exactly that. And um, the rug is pulled out from under me and I learned very quickly what it is you guys as a group are going to be about. And I'm like, oh, and I think that it took that whole season. It took all of season two for me to learn. All right, just let them do plan whatever you want, but let them do the thing and it's going to be fine either way. And accept that what comes out of it is is probably what's supposed to, regardless of whatever it is my theory is for something. Um, but I think we Which work out better GM that way. Skill anyway. Well, and it's it one is, I'm having yeah. to learn learn by force, and that's fine, because I wouldn't have and learned if it I otherwise. The, my timeline on that correctly, a couple sessions later, you were doing a pretty good job of it. Um I remember Is this the Bush the thing? Bur- well, that, but I was actually thinking even before then you had um you know, you had the whole orc ambush, uh, which was real fun. But um, oh, before yeah. that, yeah, yeah, we'd gone to like this lake house, found the kid. We're like, oh, we're going to fight off all these lizard folk that are following us. And my character kind of walked out, did a little speech going, hey, I'm super awesome. Are you sure you want to fight me? And you were like, you know what? I think some of them don't. And that was just a very natural way to handle that. I was like, yeah. We're having an encounter, not a fight, which is right. a I, thing that people have to learn to do in Dungeons & Dragons, especially people who are super invested in the tabletop showy pieces and the big fight setup. Oh, sure. Yeah. I do love my models. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and, and know, it, I, it works because we're not beholden to... Um, you guys reaching a certain amount of XP to level up, we sort of just make a decision that time has gone long enough and you've done enough things, so move to the next level. And Pretty much. so arbitrating out where a lot of your XP should come from into some other fashion isn't a problem, like, logistically. We're not, like, hampering well, just, ourselves by doing that. Yeah, yeah just I, to touch on that real quickly... I, we've been like Grant and I are in a, a home game together um, with, you know, some other friends of ours and his wife and stuff. And we've been using that method for, I don't know what, about eight years or something like that now. Right, Grant? Um, and it's just yeah. better as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> like not having to deal with that extra layer of bookkeeping is just it kind of just frees up mental cycles to do other more enjoyable things as far as I'm concerned. I mean, honestly, I think our method of keeping track is somebody goes, are we leveling up anytime soon? And the GM goes, oh yeah, it's been a while. All right. Yeah. Level up. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. That's <laughs> or, a valid or method. Like in our um, most recently with us, it's like, you guys are really getting stepped on by a lot of the the stuff that I want to use in the game. Why don't you just take two levels and let's see how that goes? <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, good. That's the classic. Uh oh, the GM's been reading the monster manual. Uh huh. Oh, look at the thing we I thought. Oh, you whole, guys are under leveled, huh? We we mm. could do a whole D and D D and D like specific podcast on Peter's struggles and my struggles to figure out encounter balance in a world oh, where. The part you know, car- people are not making normal D and D characters, and often <laughs> don't want to fight. <laughs> yeah, like um, I have never in my entire GMing career had what must be the exquisite pleasure of running a game for the standard fighter cleric wizard rogue party. Not once. <laughs> no, I'm actually about to because. Uh, my daughter went with a tabaxi rogue. My son went with a dragonborn sorcerer. And Chrissy was like, you know what? They need a tank and they need healing. Oh, fine. I'll play a cleric. Just <laughs> don't expect me to change my spells. No, so. Ever. no, no, no that's fine. No, no offense, Peter, but that's also how I feel about playing a cleric. <laughs> hey, man, you can't all be people of taste. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mood. Clark is my favorite class. <laughs> this is wide one of the one of my least. characters I have played in five V that had spells was in your game. Greg, what do you think yeah, of the, the family uh, friendly? The swarm of What's crickets. It? <laughs> it just you know, those at home could not see Cameron's face shaking at that. I don't know, Peter. Have you listened to the Kingmaker um, session zero? 
I have not. <laughs> <laughs> Greg made a thing. <laughs> I didn't even bring it up. Greg made a whole pile of a thing. It wasn't a pile, it was humanoid shaped. It is <laughs> loosely humanoid shaped. I have a particular way I am viewed online, and it is much nicer and friendlier than I am in person. I am not as nice in person as I am online. And so playing a strictly family-friendly game, especially having, especially in other not G and PG rated games for other podcasts, it, it is there 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 is you have to force yourself to do that. And that is not a bad thing. Yeah. No, I think it, it forces us to make some interesting decisions. And Ben, or not Ben, Grant neatly already answered question number two on my list uh, while answering question number one. So we skip that one now because it was going to be the same question, but for GMing. Um, okay. Okay. I'm going to ask a tough question. Well, yeah, well, that's a tough question now. Um, what's it like trying to, in some form or fashion, and we have done this differently across the last you know number of seasons um because i think we're still trying to figure out exactly how we want to do it what is it like trying to incorporate faith into a game in some form or fashion i mean the difficulty and process varies enormously depending on what you're running i had a very hard time with it with in impulse drive for example because science fiction settings by and large are not stories that faith enters into where it's it's yeah. only treated one very specific way, and it's not necessarily how we would approach it. I think so. That's very that's commonly. fair. Yeah, um, you know, for for me, I had I don't know. It's kind of a combination of things. I I would say for some of the characters I've played, it's honestly it's it. Um, the faith in and of itself just kind of presents in the just in the character of the player um without without it being like explicit or or like you know kind of because the last thing i want to do is is be like really really like beat you over the head with a bible kind of deal so oh, yeah, yeah, yeah we we are not a so, hellfire and brimstone podcast no no uh, i'd i'd definitely figured that out very early which is which is good um but i like for for liesel and ansel who i had a lot of experience with it was it was a little more understated and with vatten i had like this through line of um everyone was coming up with their own like you know cultural kind of aspect of what you know it looks like for them was. yeah yeah so so mine was the guiding star which for vatten i think worked very well because again you have a character who started from a very rough life and had a moment to turn his life around and is kind of trying to abide by that so for for me it was for vatten it was like this kind of aspirational goal and uh, for the other characters it was it was you know there's a certain amount of faith i think i remember ansel having that great conversation with the 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 cyclopean monk uh where there was a discussion of like morality and what um you know at, at the time i was digging into a lot of philosophy so some of the like kierkegaard stuff came out where but it was but it was you know discussing like the uh, imperatives of doing the right thing and i mean i it was kind of fun to dig in with that as a character and i think that's something kind of underutilized is being able to use stuff like this to uh ask questions explore even be able to like you know deepen your faith because it's you're playing in a sandbox that's a safe space to to kind of explore that um so yeah it was I, I thought that was a really good idea for me to like dig into some like older philosophy and theology and like actually get to play around with it in a in a space that's uh kind of i mean maybe not intentionally designed for it but conducive it feels like conducive to it yeah well and, and not to be uh, overtly on the nose about it i think we have the right space to do kind of 
more of a um, who we're supposed to be by way of show, like by way of action and not by way of talking. Like the faith comes out in the actions of the characters and the decisions and how you actually treat people, which is how faith sh should in most cases manifest itself in, in my mind is in how you, in a lot of cases in, in how you treat other people and, Peter, I think, by way of force, is very good at pushing us that direction. Compliment, and I mean that as as a compliment. I think that's that's the direction I wanted us to go, and I just didn't know it when yeah, we started. Yeah, that's certainly what I was trying to do with with Desilov. And actually, it's it's been interesting as the guy who's kind of constantly playing like the religiously flavored characters. I mean, I've played clerics and paladins, and that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, yeah, more or less, and. I am uh, I am very comfortable with those character types, but um, there were some times earlier on where I actually tried to lean into that even harder, and you actually kind of pulled me back, and we did like some edits to make it a little more subtle, which I I thought was kind of interesting, because um, I I mean like the the kind of the kind of faith that you saw from. Some at least what I was trying to depict was that very kind of genuine, compassionate. It is about how you treat other people, and you're going to treat them well, kind of a thing. Right. And, I'm trying uh, to remember the part you're talking about. I I think I actually like I wanted to I did like a prayer or something or like referenced like you know god somehow directly oh, or something like that okay. and sometime in season like, two eh, yeah maybe not quite so on the nose and I was like, oh, okay okay i mean i you know i have so, some vague memories of this yes yeah i yeah. i think that was that was more uh, my interpretation of it anyway was was that we wanted um i mean it was twofold i think if i remember correctly uh Ryan hadn't quite settled on how we were depicting God or or any central deity in in the in the world setting. So I think Ryan was I like, think "We still haven't." <laughs> I was going to say well, spoilers. We we still haven't entirely. And it's yeah, yeah, not not entirely, but it's more fleshed out than it was at the time. So I think Ryan was like, uh, maybe a little bit different direction so we can like kind of hash that out a little better. But I mean, also, like, you know, you kind of want to, um, uh, I don't know, maybe avoid any mild heresy or controversy. I think that's kind of a secondary concern. We do try and avoid the heresies. Yes. <laughs> Not that that's particularly come up for us, but yes, we would like to avoid the heresies. We we do prefer to not do the heresy here. Um, that's modalism, Patrick. What is it? Ginny says, "Do a bad." Yeah, I, yeah, I try and avoid. Yeah. I try and avoid doing a bad um, as often as possible with this. Um, okay. It's in this podcast we adhere to the Council of Nicaea. <laughs> Look, Daniel, it's been a long time since I was a freshman in college, so I don't remember what I agreed to, but that's fine. Because <laughs> I know I was taught that, but to be honest, I don't remember it anymore. But that's not important right now. See, I, I was I actually just pictured like, um, you know, a bunch of like ancient Christian guys standing around and the, like the podcast just glued to them. No, not that kind of it here. <laughs> I made my sense of uncle now. He has. Um, I don't know Daniel's particular denominational background, but just from what I know of everybody else, I believe we have five different denominations recognized between us. Maybe Probably. six because of Daniel. I don't know. Uh, well, Good. I was raised Baptist, married into Pentecostal, now go to UC, uh, UCC. So... Uh, Methabaptic cost the congregational. Welcome. Um, I think, yeah, I think your boy is the lone Pentecostal in the group currently. I may be mistaken about that, but it, yeah. at least on this show tonight, I think I'm the lone, I'm the lone Pentecostal. Um, okay. So, and I'll, I'll ask it this way. Cause I know we can, we've got kind of a weird schedule tonight. 
Do we want to keep going on faith or do we want to go to the last thing on my list? I have a quick thing on the, on the faith one. And this is more of a, like, kind of just putting this out there. Yeah, um, yeah, we can like, I, I, this is one of the things that I think is very interesting about Kingmaker so far, like both with being like a pre-made campaign, but it's also Pathfinder. It's also, I'm going to say edgy, but not in like the internet meme kind of edgy. Yeah. Um, we don't do that here. Um, but, but yes, like, I, yeah. And, and this is something that like, of course we as like players in the game or characters in the game don't really know each other yet. Um, but I do think it's interesting that at least so far in Kingmaker, there have been no, no characters seem to have explicitly tied faith to their character. I know I definitely didn't with Ezek, um, but oh, Greg said saying he had, he is um, the the leshy. Yes, uh, the leshy is but, in fact tied. Yeah, very heavily. Uh, it just hasn't come up much. Yet. Okay. Yeah, that's that's kind of why I wanted to couch that with like, I mean, in game time, we've known each other for like four hours or something like that. <laughs> like and that, yeah. So, like More several like, of those, we were asleep. So, well, like, yeah, you know. I think it's like twelve <laughs> hours with most of that. Yeah, this is true. Um, and so, yeah, that's something that I'm kind of interested in, and like, I'm curious to what, like, what this is going to look like as, again, as a as a group that we are committed to the idea of family friendly, but as a group that we're not, or at least it seems we are much less intentional, especially like when compared to like what Peter has done in the past. Sure. Uh, sure just sure. to like be specific. And so again, this is not like a commentary. This is just a, it's something that I think is interesting with how that game is shaking out. And I know that one of the things I'm excited about for Ezek is this ability to es- explore um, kind of what, this world means to him. Um, I've kind of set up the character to be at multiple crossroads um, via backstory and race and class. And like, it all kind of came together. Uh, And I'm really excited for us to kind of see where that goes for all of our characters again, without as much intention again, seemingly from our players. Yeah. That's definitely something that hasn't, at least shown itself as much so far. And I can't determine in my head yet whether or not it will for Kingmaker just due to the nature of Kingmaker, at least early on. But we'll we'll see where that ends up. And I suppose that's sort of the liability for what we do of doing something with an actual pre-written story. Um, the box is a little different. That's the nice thing about mm-hmm. being, uh, what's the word I want, homebrewed or whatever is mm-hmm. that it's a complete and open sandbox and we can do actually whatever we want without having to take a wrench, a hammer, and three saws to someone's hard work, um, politely. Uh which is what I'm gonna which is what I'm gonna do to parts of Kingmaker, but we'll we'll get there when we get there, <laughs> Greg. Kind of piggybacking with that a little bit since uh Bootsy is very intentionally, very, very heavily backstory to have parts like that. Just kind of another difference between this and like other games I've been in is I've seen discussions in Christian D&D spaces online of the, it's a heresy to have your uh, character worship God or a God like God because it's a fictional game or it's a heresy to have your character worship a fictional god because it's not god and personally i think neither of those are heresies that's beside me that's beside either way that's that's another conversation about how we can't agree with each other and get along that's something else but usually in my not city on a hill games my characters tend to just not have a focus on a faith whatsoever unless like it actually comes up in discussion in the game i just leave that blank versus like a little bit with like kind of with brock but very heavily with bootsy is making that part of them because i think prior to brock and bootsy the closest i ever got was a um asif asmir um a barbarian who I can't remember the subclass or barbarian. It was the uh, celestial kind. So anytime that like he would rage and 
pop its wings in the same turn, I had a phrase for him. By the power of the, uh, by Salune, I will punish you. Because Salune was the goddess of the moon. And I was just ripping off Sailor Moon. As one should. <laughs> no objections to that. That's fine. I mean, someone has to be fighting evil by moonlight. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> oh no! I, I actually like said the whole thing. I just swapped out some of the words for Salune and somebody else. I forgot who it was. Because I mean, if you aren't, you aren't really trying. Let's just be honest with ourselves, and we don't stand for that here. Um, so yeah, because the, the putting more of the faith into there is something I suspicious specifically. Yeah, learning how to talk again after bronchitis and still having to re-change how I say his words. But, but um, that's something I specifically like requested for it, it, whenever we were talking about those things for Kingmaker. I went, this is something like I want more of. Right. Okay, so, and that takes me to my last general question, um, which is going to be deeply self-agonizing, probably, but that's fine. Um, how How can we do it better? any of it i think the first thing we need to make sure of and this is a general statement about a lot of family friendly and christian media is assure our basically make sure that we are not substituting family friendly and christian for good hard sure agree. hard agree no objection there there's a lot of stuff that just rides on the coattails of family friendly and doesn't actually put effort in and it deserves just as much or more effort when, you know, there's an element, at least any element of faith involved. To paraphrase Jenny. the nineties and got a lot of sh Christian shovelware sent my way. Uh, so, trust me, it, the children's media market is also still that. It hasn't gotten, it's gotten better, but not enough. Um, Sorry, I I just got a flashback of, uh, there were VHS tapes that uh -oh. were like sil silver bordered. That was about a family that like fell into quicksand and then showed up in. Bible oh, time. yeah. Uh-huh. I know exactly. I don't think they were a family, but they're like, they're teenagers. I know exactly no, no, was, what you're talking like a, about. It was like a whole, mm -hmm. a whole family. There's like three of them, three or four of them. Yeah, and they don't just, remember anything about that. They travel I think it was through called, history, Bible history. I think it was called Adventures in the Bible. Probably. That's all I got. Mm -hmm. I have no so, idea what the quality of that was. Mid. Oh, I could guess the quality right away, <laughs> but no, that's no, just because uh, I grew up co watching. Combination of better than you think, but less than it should have been. Which is Here, maybe not inspiring. But... Here's my question. How did they handle you know, speaking, them speaking English, and I'm going to assume they felt, did they fall into Old Testament or New Testament? Yes. Both? <laughs> they never knew when their next sleep would go, or if it would be the one home. He's not that <laughs> wrong about how the show worked, actually. <laughs> That's a... So how did they handle the language barrier then? God. They definitely... There were definitely parts at the start of each episode where someone was not speaking English. I just don't remember what the resolution was. Um, nope. and, and for reference, it is called The Greatest Adventure Stories from the Bible. I was so close. He was, he was quite close. Um, 13 videos between 1985 and 1992. <sighs> uh, and to, to, to do as I often do and semi-paraphrase Jenny... Uh, which I do as often as possible. Um, it is possible to do a Christian and still do a bad. Um, oh, and that yes. is something I do actively want us to avoid doing. And I'm not just speaking from like a, a heretical standpoint. I just mean in general, you can, yeah. you can certainly do both um, actively. You can do both accidentally. And that's one thing you can also do both actively. And that's the yeah. thing I don't want to do. We will we will make mistakes on here, and that's fine. You can correct those. You can walk things back. You can make changes. You can do whatever. But I don't I don't of, ever want us to actively do a bad 
while also actively doing a faith. Um, that not yeah. how that work. Only so, one of us yeah. here is actually a pastor. Okay. Not so, me. <laughs> so, um, oh, I forgot about that. That's true. Yeah. Okay. Touche. Yeah. So I, I think to get back to your original question of like, <laughs> right. I had one. Yeah. What, what could we do better? Um, so it's, it's a little like, it's, it's a tricky question to answer just in general. Um, just because it's, it's like, Hey, uh, you, it's like, what things are we missing? It's, it's a hard question to answer. Um, I thought I would think of something by this point. Sometimes and... I just start sentences, then hope by the time I get to the end, I found something. Welcome to my DMing structure. Um, <clears throat> but, but, but to uh, like, it's, it's a tough question to answer. Honestly, I think. And don't um, worry about offending me. I want you to not yeah. let that be the concern in whatever you say. That's the, worry the enormously only, about offending me. I mean, I'm just going to lie. That's right. fine. No. <laughs> eh. <laughs> All right. So um, I I do think when we kind of curtailed season four with, mm -hmm. the, with the island and sailing to the island, um, the, one, the one bit of mistake that I think you might have made, Ryan. Okay. So a thing that I would have done differently. How about we phrase that and I stop... Um, qualifying all my statements however it works I, is fine the thing that i would have done differently um is we all gave you a bunch of ideas that kind of escalated in ridiculousness um uh -huh. <laughs> and i i think the thing that you could have done because there's the temptation to say yes to everything immediately and like front load all of the crazy <laughs> uh i think it would have been beneficial to start with there's an island we don't know much about it. And then just slowly discovering how more off the rails it gets as it goes, instead of start off by there's an island. Also, there's always a full moon. Also, there's a thing that's made of ice. And there's um, uh, ambulatory talking cats. Like, <laughs> just saying yes and all right up front probably made the story a little difficult to go on from there because you because you started it at 10 and a half and it only goes to 11. I mean that's fair um so that's what I would have done differently no and I, I see your point like there's there's a line but where yeah. giving you guys creative input which is not bad turns into almost spoiling the whole thing ahead of time uh, to some well, extent Yes and no. Like, you can still say yes to all of that, but you don't have to tell us that, all, like, our characters, that all of it is true immediately. I mean, that's deeply factual. Okay, fair. Fair, fair, fair. And yeah. not fair in my non-aggressive way of saying fair. Fair, Blake, you're actually right, <laughs> fair. Um, I, 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 I see you. We've, we've all been there, especially anyone who's, who's done, um, like, improv if they're like, okay, so uh, we need an occupation and a city, and someone is like, uh, waitress and Chicago, and then you start the scene with, so she was a waitress from Chicago. <laughs> and then you have nowhere right. to go after that, because you've already hit your mark. You've explained the whole thing in the first five seconds, and then there's nothing else to, to yeah. hold it so in. Okay, fair. Like, no, no, that's fair. It's a, it's a common pitfall. I did fall, and that's, that is accurate. Um, okay. So I actually have a completely different angle there. Um, because we are kind of trying to do the faith thing a little bit, I wouldn't mind like some more firmly laid groundwork of just kind of like how the cosmology of the setting works and what kind of actual traditions exist and stuff like that. Because just kind of constantly like, hinting at it but also avoiding it mm. gets a little exhausting okay. sometimes with some of my more like faith-based characters like if if i'm playing a cleric and you know it's like i kind of want him to be able to like have some 
practices and stuff that he does, you know? Okay. So it, it sounds to me, Peter, like you're volunteering to write a cosmology. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tempt me. <laughs> Don't tempt uh, me to tempt him. Um, so I get, I, again, though, this, this does sound like another thing with, with improv. That's a common, um, just a thing to practice is that, so if there's improv, one of the temptations is to be like, yeah, I heard it from the guy. So instead of saying the guy, just pick a name and go with it. Just Terrence, because it's a funny name. Uh, and just like commit to a bit and like commit to facts and then and then make them true as you fill it out. So yeah, I, I, I think that's a pretty common thing, though, is it, like there's certainly nothing wrong with just committing to a cosmology and then, I don't know, you can, if if it's not hanging together quite the way you want it to, then someone can go into a cave and accidentally break open some uh, pots and then find the living sea scrolls and then, you know... <laughs> That was so aggressively on the nose, Daniel. Fix, <laughs> fix some things about it, you know. Right. Well, and, In universe retcon. And spoilers to the audience, because I haven't talked about this publicly yet. Publi publicly yet? Publicly yet. I haven't publicly. talked about this publicly. I have not pu talked about this publicly yet. I have started writing another actual campaign, and I suppose there is no better time to actually force myself to make some decisions five and a half years after I created this world than now. Um, since I didn't do it five and a half years ago when I started and should have. So perhaps that is something. And, and look, not for nothing. There was a lot of good intentions and Ryan wants to do a thing, which is always a dangerous place to start anything. I can tell you from experience. Um, looks Honestly, at magic the gathering um but well, I, but that notwithstanding there is a point where you do have to make decisions and at some point i probably should well to your credit i i do think that you weren't like you didn't wait until everything was absolutely perfect in in order before hitting the go button which mm -hmm. is where like nine i'm gonna make up a number 98.6 percent of projects die in the i have to wait till everything's just right and then i'll start yep. phase yeah so mm -hmm. you you have you, yeah, you will never do track. anything if you're if you're working from that point the, the yeah. trick is to just keep like continue to work on it basically like oh there's an empty spot that i should fill in with something okay well I'll I need to fill that in what do I want to fill it in with you know and then yep. kind of go from there well and, and I think you're you're in a little bit of a tough spot because it's an actual play podcast and there's a record of stuff that's come before that you feel beholden yeah. to when you're writing and rewriting you can just be like nah you know what we'll change this whole thing now it's like but continuity and in season two be, episode yeah, 17 you said Right. And yeah, look, but, I don't think most listen. of our fans are going to take me there, but not for nothing. It's still, I have a bad practice of, at least with this, only ever answering a question after it's been asked and making up that answer when it's asked. There should actually, in some cases, be some information to work off of. Yep. And I think this kind of goes into what I was going to suggest, and it ties in with what Daniel um, was saying. Uh, and one, I think... I think we could do more with the players being wrong oh, or the yeah. characters being wrong, I guess is the way to say it. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, now, like I say that I'm going to immediately caveat it with, <laughs> but it's a fine line. Um, like this is something that like, I know when I'm creating characters, I try to work into their story and Ryan, I gave you some with Ezek, right. Of like this character believes these things. They might not be true. Or these are the things that like something happened here. I don't know what it is. Like, I Room think that that's with. something that can be very valuable. And I think that there is to use the, the role in insight check or roll a history check. Oh, you rolled a 20, you know, this, like you can know a fact that's wrong. Like, I think that there's some more stuff that can happen with that type of thing. I um, mean, again, it's a fine line. You don't want to know, but um, like it's, it's hard to balance like that lore building with, 
not wanting to just be like, no, I didn't like what you came up with, but um, I do think that there's something there. And then another thing, and this is something that I'm trying to do more um, in the games I'm DMing is, is have stuff that is canon, but is not discussed. So the idea of, oh, this character went and this is what happened, but they might not share all of that with the group. Um, And leaving that as a way of like your character is, it's hard to do this when you're playing, especially for an actual play where where you're trying to get things in. And it's not like you can sit down and type out a message. Um, But I feel something like, Hey, yeah, I have it. Like let's work on that later um, and flush that out later. Uh, And then have it be something that's implied to be there but there can be mystery that the players as a whole don't know about okay so i like i don't have to fill in every part of the blank all at once correct oh absolutely you drive yourself crazy trying like (laughs) um but if if there's something that you want to have come up um or that keeps coming up organically that you're kind of unhappy leaving ambiguous Mm -hmm. that's probably a sign that it's time to work on that specific thing whatever it is Mm -hmm. Hmm. literally noted written down interesting yeah um okay so and then and we we need to go ahead and wrap up but um i guess grant if you want to real quick just any thoughts on the impulse drive game that you just want to throw out there, you or Peter. Um, if you guys just have any thoughts on impulse drive and I'll say oh, the same I've, Cameron I've or Greg, any thoughts them, on, but... on Kingmaker? <laughs> uh, go ahead, Peter. Okay. So um, one of the, one of the things that was really interesting to me for impulse drive. And I, I, I know I've mentioned this to like the other people who are involved. I don't know if I've said it on the air was it was really striking to me how well suited uh, powered by the apocalypse mechanics were to what we're doing with an actual play Hard because agree. the 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 fic- the friction was so low where it's like you just do one quick die roll and it's like okay so it's a really simple modifier if there's any at all and it's just like in this range it's all good in this range it's complicated but still kind of works out and in this range something bad happens and everything else is just made up on the spot that worked really really well where it's not like uh, okay what's its armor class like what's your what's the dc for this what's the it's just the smoothing out of that um numerical you know kind of consideration stuff that comes with a crunchier system like D really made that game very um we had a lot of room to focus on things with more emotional resonance and stuff i think it wasn't like, just um, hit the thing yeah, well, or even just negotiate with the thing, which is what we more often do. Like, there, like I, I remember, um, you know, it was like the first or the second session where I kind of like, um, Alistair like tracked the guy down and like he ex- he kind of like ran into traffic trying to get away, and I had to like jump in after him and like toss him to safety, and then kind of like interrogated him afterwards, or like dealing with. Um, like the the character that I, f- I forget um, what her name was, but she had um, kind of like a phobia of space and being out in the vacuum. Oh, so um, like yeah, yeah, dealing yeah. dealing with that, um, it, it was just you know there was more room for that sort of a thing. So that Liz's I, character, I really yes, Liz's character, who's I it's like I remember Liz, but I'm just trying to remember the name of the character, and it's bugging me. Um, when when yes that i yes that it helps was that it. i edited okay. this like a week and a half ago so that's the only reason i remember <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> nothing yeah. like a recent jog to the memory but but yeah like you know just more room that sort of thing really couldn't come up in D as easily and it just came up all the time in impulse drive and i thought that was kind of cool or it can come I up but say. it can't actively matter in the same way that it can in in powered by the apocalypse which is nice yeah yeah there's no rule structure that makes it matter in other games or in there's not as much space for it either yeah no i will say uh, on the storytelling side of that coming up with complications 
is very difficult at times. Sometimes they're obvious. Sometimes it's like, oh, well, this is maybe I shouldn't have had you roll or, okay, it's interesting if you fail, something's going to happen. I just got to think about what that can be. And that, that is sometimes difficult. That is the one challenge, the, the biggest challenge I would say in running games like that is coming up with complications and making hard moves um, when, you know, when there's a failure. Right. Like I do, there, I, there being more yeah. consequence. Yeah. Uh, okay. And to a certain degree, being willing to drop the hammer and make consequences happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, that part's definitely scary. I also am a big fan of, occasionally ominously saying okay we'll worry about the bad stuff later and then just making a note and then just wrapping it back around to eventually um okay either of the kingmaker yeah. homies what you got or both of the kingmaker homies neither of the kingmaker homies say so, greg you can go first i <laughs> no. feel like i've talked more than greg both, so. both of you greg's also be... sick <laughs> No, yeah, I was both. gonna say Greg is You're recovering not from bronchitis. Yeah. Greg doesn't have a voice. No, Take no, no. On the poor guy. No, both <laughs> of you speak at the same time, and the words have to line up. <laughs> wow. Hamburger. Nope, already failed. All Didn't right. get there. We okay. <laughs> finish each other's <laughs> hamburgers. <laughs> All right. Um, I can go ahead and go. Yeah, go for um, it. So I, I'm really excited about Kingmaker. I've really been enjoying our sessions that we've had so far, and I, I like that. We have a diverse group of players uh, oh, and yeah. a pretty diverse group of characters. Um, and I'm really loving that we're still very much like finding our footing. Um, I will forever love that Hyena Dad is for some reason the voice of reason. Yeah, in I, I, this don't, group, I don't know how but... your character is in charge, but because he shouldn't. Yeah. No offense. That's not the yeah. character you created. Um, yeah. As a, but he as is 100% is in charge. Be, but, but yeah. It's a uh, it's yeah, an interesting really moment, that. and uh, it's I feel like we're we're having some good RP. I'm excited for people to find their characters more. I feel like that's taken us a bit compared to um, some other things, and sometimes that's just how the characters go. Um, well, and like and, you said, the first part of Kingmaker is literally like yeah. a video game tutorial level. Like, yeah, it's like the first ten levels of WoW. Like, don't yeah. leave the safe space and only touch the thing you're supposed to for the next 30 minutes. And so it, I think it takes a little bit to get going in that yeah, sense. And I definitely agree. And as someone who's like played the game, um, I've not, I haven't beaten it, but I've played a good chunk of it. And obviously it's not one-to-one analogous, but like, I'm very excited for us to open up into um, the wider world and what yeah. that's going to look like and what that's going to mean for our characters. Mostly danger. Um, mostly danger. Mostly danger. Um, but yeah, I'm, excited that. I'm also excited that we're doing Pathfinder. Like, yeah, I know, like, as someone who was not overly around City on a Hill when the OGL stuff was going on, but was definitely very appreciative of the things that y'all said. Um, I'm very excited that um, that City is using this as an opportunity to highlight additional games. Oh, yeah. um, and but not just with uh, Pathfinder, but also with Impulse Drive. Um, and as someone who's wanted to learn Pathfinder and play it for a long time, um, I'm very excited to use this as the opportunity to do that because I, I like the rule structure of Pathfinder. Um, obviously you have to find your rule of cool, do all of those things. Don't weigh sure. things down. It, it needs to not be math finder, but like, um, and it feels less say, math findery than Pathfinder one did. Yes. Yeah. Um, but I do like that side of it. I like that there, there's a lot of intention in Pathfinder. Um, and I really enjoy that as a system. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see how things continue to, to come in and see how the ways that we've built our characters continues to, to snowball out and for us to get to know each other. Um, well, I when, have when it's stuff. not just poke the thing. Exactly. Which is yeah. what which is what it's been so far. And and absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, and I think it's I think we're gonna see some interesting like alliances and like parties within our bigger group spring up as we get going farther and farther, just with how certain characters are. Um I have preemptively so, yeah, a lot of concerns now that you've said that. Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna mess with you about head. some stuff. Oh no. Uh, okay, that's fine. 
And uh, bring it on. Yeah, I, I'm I'm super interested in, um, in how we're going to all be bringing these characters to life. Uh, yeah, great. A lot of the same. Uh, it is my first time, first time playing anything Pathfinder related, except for like one time whenever I was looking up a stat for an enemy in a game, and I somehow looked up the Pathfinder version <laughs> and. That was very overpowered for what I was looking for for a fifth edition game. Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. Oh no! <laughs> Remind me to tell you I guys love- the the Star Wars CR story at some point in the future. We don't have time for that now. Um. <clears throat> but it, I have been very much enjoying it and getting to try and again getting to try out the different games that we've been doing and seeing where that is going to take us in the future. And and we, spoilers, we don't know where we're going in the future yet, but we're figuring <laughs> it out slowly. Um, and, and I think we have some interesting opportunities coming up. And to do, to keep, like Cameron said, highlighting some different things, um, but just also finding spaces where we're comfortable playing. Because we've played a bunch of different things and some of them we've been very comfortable with and some of them, Kingmaker. Uh, Ryan's at least not very comfortable with yet. Sweet mercy, they made some rules changes from 1.0, Pathfinder to 2.0. Um, but that's fine. We're we're getting there. Thank you, Cameron, um, for the assistance. But uh, I I think we'll we'll get there in the long run. Uh, and this this specifically tonight is something you will start hearing on occasion. Um, like I said, our our semi annual city council meetings, um, where we're just going to bring in different folks and talk about. DMing stuff and character stuff and player stuff and ideas we have and and things that we don't really things that we don't get to talk about in a two and a half hour session because we're talking about the business of like you said math finder um or how are you making fish puns yeah and we're making fish puns um I looked at some decisions I was making for season five and I may have to change some of them specifically to avoid that exact thing hap- happening again um you I'm can't stop ones? me. I, I can try and divert you slightly, um, but no, I can't. I cannot stop you. Uh, you can't stop it. It's happening. Um, embrace I just, it. I can just see Daniel just like reaching over and like pulling his giant book of fish puns just closer, and closer listen, with every word. Now, listen. I will make fish puns just for the halibut. There it was. I knew it was going to happen eventually. That was the easy. But that, and honestly, I think we all know that was the easy one, and that, was that he's capable of, of yes. much more than that. Um, yeah, so let's not, let's not press the I've issue. Actually, yeah. you really don't want me to let slip the cods of war. There it was. All right, that was I better. Think you've made the halibut one before. He has. He's made both of those before. Oh, um, yeah. That season, shooting fish in a barrel. That one's also happened. Yes, yeah, he season two. <laughs> Um, so that's all the time we have for tonight. Um, thank you to Peter, Grant, Greg, Daniel, and Cameron for joining me. Um, links in the descriptions to all the places you can find them on the internet and all the places you can find us on the internet. Uh, our website sort of works now. Um, and I may be moving things to YouTube. I got to figure some, some stuff out first, but I'm considering doing that. But I think the website sort of is functioning again, loosely. Are you going to, are you going to put the Zoom call video on YouTube then too, so right. people could actually see the weird facial expressions and hand movements? I think. But then all oh, of yeah. you guys could see the weird facial expressions I make when I don't know what to do anymore, and that's, that's dangerous fun. for everyone. That's um, the fun of it. That's not true at all. Um, so uh, for Cameron, I'm going to continue to be just an avatar icon because I have a very camera shy spouse. <laughs> That's understandable. Um, and I have a very oh, camera shy me. Camera. Um, hi, I'm camera shy. It's okay. Uh, Cameron, hi, say bye to nice shy, people. Hold I'm on. dad. But Ryan, <laughs> are you Cameron shy? No, never. Uh, we love Cameron here. Um, Cameron, say bye to the nice people. He can't. He's over. He's overwhelmed by the puns. He can't even say bye to the nice people. Cameron. Say bye to the nice people. Bye. Sorry, my Discord updated and it locked up my audio. Oh, no, you're good. <laughs> Dang oh. it, Discord. Uh, all right, Cameron, say bye to the nice people. Bye, nice people. Take two. Daniel, say bye to the nice people. Uh, we're doing GURPS and Warhammer 40K 2024. Don't listen to that man ever. <laughs> he does not speak for us. And now it really is like a city council meeting. Greg, say bye to the nice people. Bye, everybody. Peter. Bye, everybody. And Grant. 
Daniel, I just got a bunch of Warhammer stuff if you're interested. Tag Nevit! <laughs> I've been outvoted. This is how democracy See, works. That will make you have to do the videos as part of the the Zoom videos on YouTube then, so people can actually see the Warhammer. Not, not models, is, just like my is. brother-in-law's massive collection of extra Warhammer stuff. I'm I can't wait so to roll trouble. up uh, Tyranids. It's going to be great. I do have Rogue Trader. I, I enjoy Rogue Trader. It's a terrible system. That's never been a problem for us. If, if I'm being entirely there, honest. There is nothing <laughs> remotely family-friendly about the entire Warhammer 40k universe. That's aggressively true, actually. There's probably that's kids' like, books. literally the point. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Yeah, that is basically <laughs> the actual point. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that, that's, that's literally the commentary that they're going yeah. for. <laughs> also it's making good. fun of Thatcherite England. And it's Warcraft in space. So, so again, there's nothing good or redeemable. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah, exactly. Yeah, not for not for our consumption. Uh, as always, thanks for listening, and have a blessed day. Thanks for listening to City on the Hill Gaming. If you'd like to know more, find us online at cityonthehillgaming.com or by sending us an email at cityonthehillgaming at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter at City on the Hill Game or find us online at patreon.com/slash City on the Hill Gaming. Thanks as always to our Patreon backers. Grizzly Rich, JD, Brian, Sir Lord Epic Name, Andrew, Christina, and Tony. We really thank you guys for everything you do to support the show, and we truly appreciate you. Thanks for listening, and have a blessed day. Okay, I guess we'll do a we'll do a mic set. We'll, we'll do a mic mic sec. Mic check. Check one two. Mic check one two. Check one two. Sorry, this is the second thing I've had to record tonight, so my mind's not functioning properly. Apparently. No. Um, I this uh this Ryan. Sound check. Daniel, do sound check. After a thousand years, I have broken. Hey, I'm back. Hey, it's Daniel. Uh, Greg, say hello to the nice people. Hello. Your home, your way. Our collection of everyday products is designed to help provide ease and convenience for your everyday mealtime needs. I like it. Cameron, what you got? The 11th Doctor, one white blue legendary creature, Time Lord Doctor. I am talking. Whenever the 11th Doctor deals combat damage to a player, you may exile a card from your hand with a number of time counters on it equal to its mana value. If it doesn't have suspend, it gains suspend. Two generic mana. Target creature with power three or less can't be blocked this turn. He's a 3 2. Is his ability actually called I am talking? Yep, that's oh, the flavor. Yeah. The flavor for it. Oh, intriguing. It's the flavor ability word. Yeah. Curious. Grant. Ah, after 10,000 years, I'm free. It's time to conquer Earth. Yeah, we can do that tonight. That's fine. And yeah, Peter. Uh, hi. That's Peter. Hi. All right. We've, we've, we've got a world conquering Grant on the. That's new. Nobody remembers Rita Repulsa. Oh, I absolutely do. I was... I knew I knew exactly what you were doing. I'm here for it either way. I kind of live in a pinky in the brain mindset, so anytime we want to conquer anything, that's fine. Or just go back to the '90s and remember them fondly. Yes, you want to hear yeah. a video I saw recently that was semi-related to Pinky in the Brain? Semi? Okay. The guy, the guy who voices Pinky, he does a lot of voice acting. Like, he was also Yakko on Animaniacs. But he also did um, Dr. Scratch and Sniff. So I saw a video of him and E.G. Daly, who was doing her Tommy Pickles voice, and he was doing Dr. Scratch and Sniff. And they were doing the courtroom scene from Few Good Men. Yep. I, I find that moderately concerning, that. but okay. I'll allow it. It's it's really funny. I, I saw some... J just there. imagine Tommy Pickles saying... You want the truth? You can't handle the truth. I'd have watched that episode of Rugrats repeatedly. There was really something there. Someone should write that down. Okay.